I can count you in, okay? Yep. Okay, so in three, two. Good evening. I now call to order the Equity Committee meeting with the Equity Advisory Council for Thursday, May 26, 2022. In accordance with board policy 8311, the chair of a committee at their discretion and after consultation with the staff liaison may convene in an in-person committee meeting. Otherwise, all committee meetings will be held electronically. Today's meeting being held virtually and broadcast through Microsoft Teams. In order to efficiently conduct this meeting, committee and council members will state their name before speaking. Ms. Fass, please call the roll to determine the presence of a quorum of the committee. Ms. Scott. Present. Dr. Hager. Ms. Jose. Mr. Thomas. And Ms. Rowe. Present. Thank you. Yes, thank you. Um, there was a president that I wasn't quite sure who that was, if that was Mr. Thomas or Ms. Jose. Ms. Scott, that is Ms. Jose. Okay, thank you. All right, and um, Ms. Fass, could you please call the names of those staff members on the equity committee um, attending today's meeting? Dr. Yarborough. And Mr. Handy. Present. Any other staff members? Thank you. All right, and Ms. Fass, please call the role of the Equity Advisory Council members participating in today's meeting. Jackie Brewster. Present. Clifford Collins. Bianna Bianca Crockett. Maggie Cummins. Solomon Davis. Present. Heather Denmeyer. Present. Frank Dunlap. Denim Fisher. Kelvin Ganesh. Jemiah Giles. Javeen Hardin. Alejandra Ivanovich, Kevin Jennings, Shane Jensen, Sherelle Jones, Dr. Scott Krugman, Jane Lee, Maria Lowry, Elena Mackle. Present. Uh, Thank you. Monica joins Massey. Marcellus McQueen. Lisa Norton. Aaron O'Toole Trivis. Marlena Purcell Colton. Dr. Bash Farrowin. Lena Polite. Brianna Ross. Dr. Monica Sample, Abir Shanawi, Donna Sibley, present. Dr. Zamira Simpkins, Michelle Stansberry, present. Megan Stewart Sicking, Tiffany Stith, Dr. Aaron Sullivan. Lauren Tillman, Sam Tillman. Present, sorry, present. No worries. I, I, sorry, pre present as well. Sam Tillman. Juliana Valencia Banks. Present. And Avery Webb. Thank you. Thank you. And I just wanted to note if to see if there were any staff members participating in today's meeting that we did not call. OK, and are there any other board members participating in the call that I that were not named? Mary Yarbrough, Ms. Scott. 
Oh, Dr. Yarbrough, thank you. All right, so it looks like You're the welcome. first I, I'm sorry. All right, didn't want to cut anyone off. <laughs> so the first item of new business is a presentation on working with immigrant communities and the importance of language access. And for that, I call on Mr. Handy. Thank you, Ms. Scott. I'm very excited this afternoon to have our, um, I would say a guest presenter, but uh, Ms. Valencia Banks has also agreed to join our council. So I want to welcome her as a council member. I uh, had the chance to meet her a few months ago and uh, the work that she does with county government certainly uh, impacts and intertwines uh, with the work that we do here in the school system. So she is the uh, Julia Valencia Banks. She's the Immigration Affairs Outreach Coordinator in the office of the Baltimore County Executive. And um, at this point, I'm going to uh, cease with my introduction and turn it over to Ms. Valencia Banks for her presentation this afternoon. So thank you and welcome to the council. Thank you so much. I'm really excited uh, to be part of the council and to join you all in um, this work, which I think is incredibly valuable. So I'm uh, first of all really thankful for the opportunity and also very thankful for the work that the council has done. And I will preface this by saying I come from um, doing direct services. So for 13 years I did direct services with immigrant communities. And so um, in that work, we saw many of the different barriers that immigrant communities face and we've all and I've also seen the lack of understanding of um, what our immigration system is and how it impacts our new American communities. So I want you to think of. And for those of you that are. Un under 40, you may not actually have ever seen one, but think of the rotary phones that we used to have, right? So where you would go and you would stick your finger and have to make the long turn and then go and stick your finger and do another turn, right? So this is how we made phone calls with this, you know, very antiquated phone where all you could do was make phone calls, right? You couldn't um, text, you couldn't send emails, you couldn't take pictures, you certainly couldn't, um, you know, do social media or work on your phones. And now we walk around with tiny computers in our pockets um, that allow us to send pictures, to send emails, to prepare presentations, uh, to get directions. And that's where our immigration system is, right? So when we're uh, working with our immigrant population, most of them are stuck in this rotary phone system when we live in a smart phone age. And the immigration system in this country has not caught up to that smartphone age, right? We are in a rotary system when we're at an iPhone 12. And so this lack of catching up to the reality has caused a lot of barriers for our communities. And so that we're all on the same page, we'll start with some definitions so that uh, when I throw out different terms, everybody understands what I'm talking about. I will also say while I find my voice incredibly pleasant and I think I'm the most fascinating person in the world, um, all of you aren't going to feel that way. So I welcome and encourage you to please ask questions um, because I do want this to be a dialogue, not just me reading off of um, a presentation for you because then it'll just get really boring and it's already you know, late in the evening, so we don't want to bore anyone to tears. With that, um, I am the first Immigrant Affairs Outreach Coordinator for Baltimore County. This is a brand new role and I'm excited and privileged to be able to um, take on this responsibility and the work that we are, that I'm doing aligns with the work that um, we are doing here today. So um, when I talk about working with immigrant communities, uh, one of the ref terms that often folks here is refugee. And given what's been happening the last six months with the situations in Afghanistan and the situation in Ukraine, we hear that term a lot. 
but it is often not used correctly. Um, folks that enter the country, so the folks that enter the United States as refugees are persons that have been forced to leave their home country um, in order to escape war, persecution, or natural disaster. We're all clear on that, right? Um, the part that often um, gets confusing for folks is that they don't understand that that uh, designation, the refugee designation, does not come from the United States or from the simple fact of fleeing persecution or fleeing war. It's a designation that comes from the United Nations High Commission on Refugees. And when folks enter the country with that designation, they come in with permission. And in a year, these folks are able to apply for something called adjustment of status. So they're able to become green card holders. So they will have um, their lawful permanent residence within a year of coming into the United States. When folks enter the country as refugees, they also come, they, um, in addition to coming in with permission, they also come in with benefits that are not um, allowed to other groups of immigrants, right? So they will come uh, with access to case management, housing assistance, they'll be eligible for um, forms of social services that other groups are not. They'll also have access to a work permit, so they'll be able to work uh, with permission in the country. And so this is a group, while they are fleeing at terrible situations, they are also entering the country with um, some permissions. The next term that is often um, used but also confused is asylees. So people that are designated as asylees are similar to refugees, are folks that are seeking or have been granted asylum. So when you present at the southern or northern border or at an airport um, and you're coming from a country where you may fear persecution or have experienced persecution, you can ask for asylum. And asking for asylum does not necessarily mean that that asylum is going to be granted. It just means that you have asked for it. Um, during the pandemic, folks uh, that presented at the southern border and asked for asylum were actually not allowed into the country uh, because of the public health emergency. Um, the Trump administration enacted a policy called Title 42. And what that did is it stopped the um, admittance of folks coming into the country seeking asylum. And so we saw uh, what we equate to refugee camps on our southern border, folks waiting to get in. There was a ticketing system put in place where on any given day, 10 or only one person were allowed into the country. Um, during the Biden administration, Title 42, um, the Biden administration tried ending Title 42, tried lifting Title 42 because we have gotten a hold of the COVID pandemic, right? We are not um, seeing the numbers that we were seeing two years ago. We're also now vaccinating and testing folks. But actually just this week, um, the lifting of Title 42 was blocked. Um, and so What's happening is we're staying in that system where folks that are seeking asylum are getting stuck at our southern border. There has been an exception made for folks from um, Afghanistan and Ukraine, and I will allow you all to get creative with the decisions uh, with the thinking about why some of those decisions were taken. But every other person seeking asylum uh, that is presenting at either our northern border or our southern border are having to stay um, either in Canada or in Mexico, depending on where they're coming in. Um, once a person is able to enter the country, they have one year to apply for asylum. Um, immigration is a civil process. So unlike when somebody gets pulled over for a DWI or 
they get into some kind of domestic situation where uh, a criminal attorney can be provided to that person if they're not able to afford one. In immigration proceedings, um, folks that are looking to gain status in this country are not afforded an attorney. And so with asylum seekers, once they come into the country, they have to apply for asylum. They have to submit their asylum application within one year. If they don't submit that application within one year, um, they can be barred from gaining, uh, from applying for asylum. Their asylum application can be denied. And so when we're thinking about folks that are fleeing persecution, that are fleeing famine, that are fleeing war or civil conflict, oftentimes these folks um, have experienced a lot of trauma. They may not speak the language. They may not be um, savvy enough to navigate uh, this process and may not understand that by the sheer fact that they asked asylum, it does not mean that it was granted. So oftentimes folks that are seeking asylum miss that one year deadline. For those folks that are able to apply for asylum, um, those folks have a very long wait until they're actually able to see um, the immigration judge, right? There's a backlog of um, about five years from the time you submit your application until the time that you're actually able to have your date um, in immigration court, which means that we've got asylum seekers with no actual status in the country. Um, they are asking for asylum, but they have no lawful status. Um, once you have submitted your application, um, after 190 days or 120 days, um, you are able to apply for a work permit, but that what work permit does not equate to benefits, right? So you can get a work permit so you can work lawfully um, and you can work with permission in the country, but you are not going to be eligible for any social services. You have just been given the ability to work with permission in the country. Um, I'm not an attorney. I'm not an immigration attorney. I know a lot about immigration uh, law because of the previous work that I have done, but I do just want to um, clarify that I'm not an attorney and I can't give folks legal advice, um, even though Im immigration is in my title. A lot of folks will you know, call and say, oh, can you help me with this? And I'm not an attorney, so it's not something that I can do. Um, so then we um, come to folks that are undocumented. So folks that are undocumented are folks that are lacking the documents required uh, to live here in this country with permission. Um, one of the few words that will get you in serious trouble with me are a couple that I think you can all guess, but also the term illegal or alien. Um, those words are othering and those words often have very negative um, connotations with them. So when we're talking about folks that don't have permission to be in this country. Uh, we want to describe them as being undocumented. Uh, we don't want to say anything besides that, and especially when we're thinking about children and perhaps U.S. citizens parents. We don't want to other these um, students by referring to them as illegal or anything else like that. All right, so now we're going to get to the challenges portion of being um, an immigrant or a refugee or an asylee um, here in the US. And I want you all to think about uh, some of the barriers that students and families that are living in um, poverty experience. And I will open this up to just, you know, share share what you think some of those barriers, right? We're not going to necessarily think about immigration status. We're just going to think about what some of those barriers could be that families uh, and, and students living in poverty um, could face. And if you want to, you know, put it in the chat or you want to unmute yourself and um, answer that, that would be great. thinking of some 
challenges that folks that are experiencing poverty might be facing? And actually, I should have asked this. Are folks able to unmute themselves and answer? Oh, I guess we can. We're just accustomed to saying that we want to comment in the chat and then being called on. Oh, so um, Ms. Rowe. Um, so uh, my church has helped some asylum seekers and the biggest thing I think they struggle with is the inability to access normal infrastructure that the rest of us take for granted, like being able to legally get a job, being able to um, get health insurance and, you know, if you're unemployed, accessing unemployment, accessing um, food, um, nutrition, supplement programs, the, the social services that we take for granted that if you're in poverty, you can get. Often you can't get unless you have a particular status in this country. And so some people who um, are refugees can get certain things that asylum seekers can't, and it's inconsistent with what a person's status is. Thank you so much, Ms. Rowe, absolutely. So we've talked about, you, you mentioned job, employment, health services, some of those safety nets that we take for granted so often. Um, I see Mr. Tillman, transportation to school, um, employment as well from, from someone else. Um, so these are all right on point, right? Excuse me. Um, yes. Yes, um, it sounds like Miss um, Jill's had a question or a comment. I don't believe that she's able to put it in chat, board member Jill's, because she's on the phone. Yeah, thank you, Miss Chai. Um, thank you for this presentation. My question is, does your office work with the with BCPS's ESOL office? Yes, yes, I have been in contact with the Welcome Center. Um, since I started this position because I do get a lot of constituents requests about um, enrollment or other um, needs. Okay. okay, thank you. You're welcome. Thank you, Ms. Jones. Were there any other questions? Okay. Ms. Scott, I did have one additional question. Okay, hold on. I'm sorry. Um, you already spoke, Ms. Joseph, looks like there was a question from Ms. Sibley um, that she put in the chat. I didn't know if you saw this, Ms. Banks. The knowledge of where to go for help and how to get help. Absolutely, yes, that is that is a, a challenge that these folks face. Um, and um, what was the additional question? Um, yes, so with uh, questions and everything, because I do know that we have limited time, so I want to make sure that everyone has the opportunity to ask questions and make comments. So um, yes, please go ahead, Ms. Rowe. Thank you, Ms. Scott. Um, my question is, where do we um, offer the services of early childhood, um, the Child Find program and special education services? Because those are services that any child in our school system and any child in our county is eligible for and they're free services. And I wonder how it is that we make those services known to people who might think they're ineligible because they're otherwise ineligible for a lot of other government services. Right, that's an excellent question. So with the school, with the ESOL Welcome Center, they do provide a lot of information about school aged children. Early childhood education and those kinds of programs, a lot of it, to be frank, is just word of mouth. If a family has experienced or has used those services, they may share that information with another family member. So what we have to do is we have to make sure that um, the information about those programs is um, accessible to folks regardless of language barriers and we'll talk about um, the importance of language access in um, towards the end of the presentation. So as we mentioned, the different challenges that uh, folks have are accessing employment, housing, education, transportation, the safety net support systems, um, healthcare, and one that actually didn't get brought up was uh, crime and justice, so access to the criminal justice um, system. 
And these are challenges that folks experiencing poverty or um, folks who are in marginalized communities face on a daily basis. For our immigrant um, communities, our new American communities, we add the barriers of um, not necessarily having a, a status in the country and also language barriers because oftentimes um, these two things make these other um, things that we talked about, these other uh, items even more challenging and more difficult. So when we talk about employment, um, we know that about two thirds of undocumented adults are employed. However, with that, there do um, there are some challenges. So some of the things that you will see with the parents of your children are that um, because of their status, they may take jobs that are under the table or in the informal economy, and employers will oftentimes um, not pay overtime. They'll also sometimes not pay folks uh, for working at all, right? So they'll hire somebody full well knowing that this person is undocumented, have them work a full week, and on Friday come pay time, they'll say, oh, well, you forgot to give me your social security number. Um, I'll write you your check once you give me your social security number. And, you know, knowing full well that these folks did not have a social security number, they'll um, take advantage of folks that way. Um, if somebody gets injured on the job, they won't provide, med you know, provide medical assistance for them to take care of that injury. Uh, folks are working in very unsafe environment. Um, and so even though folks without lawful status in this country um, aren't technically able to work, we do know that they do, um, but that they are at risk for being taken advantage by different um, unscrupulous um, companies and organizations that take advantage of the fear that these folks will have in raising concern uh, to some abusive behavior. Uh, we talk about housing being also a challenge for um, communities that are um, new Americans because um, affordable housing, obviously, given everything that's going on in the country, is very difficult to come by. But you know, about a third of them are homeowners. And in the Baltimore metro area, there's about 70,000 immigrant homeowners. One of the reasons this uh, becomes a challenge, though, is because uh, many new American uh, families will move into um, housing situations where the landlord will take advantage of the family, right? So if there's a leak in the basement or if there's, uh, you know, debris falling from the roof, they will call the landlord and the landlord will ignore um, the requests. And um, if, you know, the family insists on having things addressed, they will very quickly either threaten to call ICE or they will um, ask the families to leave. They'll um, just let them know that, you know, they want them to move out and folks don't know that there are laws about how you evict someone, that there's um, assistance that they may be eligible for. There's also, um, we've heard, I've worked with families that have paid for a full month of rent and then very quickly the landlord will turn around and evict them. And what this does to our students is, um, you know, our BCPS students are living in these unstable situations. Many of them do meet the definitions of being homeless because they're house sharing, right? So you may have a family that's living with two other families in a three bedroom house and um, there could be violence between the families. There could be um, abuse and the kids are being exposed to it. You may have, you know, a mom with two kids living with two, two adult males and there's no relation be between them. And so the minors could be at jeopardy. Um, with education, obviously this is something that uh, hits very close to the work that we are doing. 25% um, of unauthorized um, immigrants graduate high school. This number is obviously 
much lower than what we would want it to be. When it comes to education, there are many barriers that our students face. The first one obviously being the status, right? Um, kids that graduate high school, if they're undocumented and they live in the state of Maryland, uh, because of the work of many community advocates, uh, students that have been enrolled in DCPS um, schools, or I'm sorry, Maryland Public Schools for at least um, three years and whose parents pay taxes are eligible for free in-state tuition. I'm sorry, not free in-state tuition, but are eligible for um, in-state tuition, right? So previously, if you were undocumented and you wanted to go to college in Maryland, you would have to pay um, a not only out of state tuition rate, you would pay an international student rate, which becomes very um, nearly impossible to access, right? Um, for those of us that are still paying off student loans, we know that finances are a big barrier to accessing education um, with things that have happened on a national level, ending DACA, so Deferred Action for Childhood Arrival, was a program of uh, President Obama that allowed certain young people that were brought into the country as minors, um, so under 18 and uh, before their 16th birthday, to apply for DACA. And what DACA did is it gave these young people the ability to apply for a work permit so they could you know, get a job lawfully and it also protected them or shielded them from deportation. These kids had to either have graduated high school, um, received their GED, um, and not have any serious criminal um, things in their background check, and they had to have been brought into the country before 2012. Um, because of things, some things that happened in the previous federal administration, DACA was basically put on hold. So we have young people currently in our schools that are DACA eligible, but because of lawsuits, they're not able to apply for DACA. So if you have a student that currently has DACA, they are able to renew it, but no new students are able to apply for it. So you, in the next few years, we'll see that the majority of children that are undocumented are unable to apply for um, for DACA and you'll also see that we'll also see um, graduation rates go down with our um, new American communities. One of the um, benefits of having DACA was that it allowed young people to not only be shielded from deportation but it also gave them an extra incentive to want to stay in school because in order to get DACA, you had to have graduated from high school or be um, enrolled in a GED program and that you have completed. And so the number of students that completed high school in the country went up when DACA was enacted. And now that DACA has uh, been blocked, we are going to see a drop in graduation rates. Um, there are close to, I believe, a million DACA eligible students in the country. Um, so that gives us an idea of how vast um, ending DACA is, is how many people are being prevented from applying. Um, adding to an additional barrier in the state of Maryland, if an undocumented person graduates from trade school or graduates from college, they're prohibited from getting a professional license. So if you have an undocumented student that goes to nursing school, once they complete nursing school in the state of Maryland, they're not able to get a license in nursing. Um, that does not apply to students that have DACA. So we've got this really well-educated population and um, multilingual workforce that are being prohibited from working. Um, 
refugees are able to apply for um, for financial aid. Once asylum is granted, these folks are also able to apply for financial aid. Um, and young people who are who were victims of a serious crime or domestic violence in the United States and have what's called uh, Violence Against Women Act uh, protection, if they have that kind of visa, they're also able to apply for FAFSA, but undocumented students are not. So that motivation of graduating high school now that DACA is gone, you know, has been challenged. Also, the ability of being able to afford college is another barrier that um, many immigrants face. What's interesting is nationally, so thinking about the entire country, immigrants are more likely to hold an advanced degree than US born um, folks, but they are also less likely to have a high school education. So there's this um, dichotomy we've got at the same time, we've got folks with an advanced degree, but we've also got a group that are less likely to graduate high school. Somebody brought up um, transportation, right? So transportation to school obviously being something that impacts our students directly, but their parents' ability to get a driver's license in some states is at jeopardy, right? So Maryland is one of 16 states that allows um, undocumented folks to get driver's licenses. Um, California, Colorado, Connecticut, Delaware, Hawaii, Illinois, uh, Maryland, Nevada, New Jersey, New Mexico, New York, Oregon, Utah, Vermont, Virginia, um, the state of Washington and Washington, DC. Um, let folks that are undocumented get uh, a driver's license. In Maryland, you have to have paid taxes for two years before you're able to apply for a driver's license. So having a driver's license is obviously very important because it not only lets you know what the laws that govern our traffic um, are, um, it also makes sure that you are following those laws makes you know makes you aware that you need to have car insurance um, but whether or not you have a driver's license it doesn't necessarily mean that folks are not going to drive right but we want to make sure that folks are getting a driver's license because we know that um, in jurisdictions like ours where public transportation is not necessarily equitable and accessible getting places um, becomes very complicated um, would anybody like to take a guess as to which state was the first to allow undocumented folks uh, obtain a driver's license? And you can feel free to put it in the chat or unmute yourself. Um, it looks like we have a question from Ms. Jose. Or answer. Do you want them to? Um, sorry, let me just understand. Um, when you do the Q and A or back and forth, do you want them to put it in the chat, or or do you want it to be said verbally? They can both, either or, whatever folks are more comfortable with. It is not Maryland, is Mr. Tillman, or New York. They're very good guesses. New York is a very good guess. It was actually Washington State. And if you think about the proximity of Washington State to another country, you may guess that it has to do with pesky undocumented Canadians that needed to be able to drive. But we don't talk about those folks often enough, partly because they blend in with the rest of the population, right? The safety net um, and the support systems that folks have um, are really important for us to know about. So two thirds of undocumented families are at or below the 200% federal poverty level. <clears throat> and excuse me, and about a third are below 100%. Um, but these folks do not have access to WIC and SNAP 
um, they don't have access to Medicaid. And so filling in those needs becomes a challenge and it also becomes something that, you know, oftentimes teachers and counselors at schools are having to address, right? How, how do we find the neighborhood food pantry for um, a family to access? Uh, there's a question from Ms. Jose. Yes, Ms. Jose. Ms. Jose, did you have a question? Yes. Um, you told me about the Canadians being undocumented. So my question is, are we seeing there's a lot of Ukrainian refugees that are also going to be coming into the country due to the um, unfortunate war that they're going through. Is there the racism that steps in when you come to undocumented immigrants as opposed to coming from European countries or South American or Asian countries that you uh, have experience or witness? Yeah, absolutely. So just to clarify, folks that are coming into the country from Ukraine are technically not refugees. And the reason I want to make that clarification is that you will be seeing um, Ukrainian nationals enrolling into the public school system. And these students for now, where we are today, are not technically refugees, which means that um, very similar to undocumented students that you're more familiar with, they will not have access to any of the safety nets. Um, they are coming into the country. Um, they are being paroled in, so they are entering with permission, but that permission does not give them access to those safety nets that we so often take for granted. Um, they will be able to apply for a work permit, so they will be able to get a work permit. Um, there are also though some folks will also be able to apply for something called temporary protected status, which gives them permission to be in the country for two years and also gives them access to a work permit, but they will not be able to access all of the safety nets that we need. So you are going to have children, um, moms with kids that aren't able to get food stamps that aren't able to enroll in medical services because they are technically not refugees. Um, we definitely see a lot of racism in our immigration system. We have different pockets, uh, different groups of immigrants that are shown preference than others, right? So we've had folks um, that have been waiting at the southern border from African countries or from the Middle East um, that have not been allowed into the country that are fleeing similar situations to what's happening in Ukraine, but they were not allowed in. But once Ukrainian families started that were tip, uh, for the most part vacationing in Mexico or were uh, working in Mexico, presented at the border and asked for asylum in, into the United States, they were allowed in. So these are folks that were comfortable enough to go to a different country to vacation or had enough education to be in a different country working, um, presenting, asking for asylum, obviously because what they're facing in their home country is horrific, um, but those folks were allowed in, whereas folks from Syria, uh, folks um, from Central America that are fleeing gang violence and um, narco governments aren't allowed into the country. So we do see a lot of those implicit biases and those that racism impact our immigration policies. Thank you for that question, Ms. Jose. That was um, a good dialogue, I think, that we often don't think about. Um, So safety and access to justice. Um, one of the reasons I like to talk about this is because uh, particularly in the last four years, we've heard about, uh, you know, the bad hombres, the um, immigrants that come from expletive countries that are here to take advantage of folks that are here to rape and 
and murder folks. But by um, most measures, immigrants are linked to less criminality and not more. Um, part of the reason for that is that being connected or being arrested um, puts you in immediate jeopardy of being deported, right? So once you're arrested, um, you get fingerprinted and depending on how you entered the country, those fingerprints will go to the Department of Homeland Security. And depending on where you live, so what jurisdiction you live in, um, that could immediately trigger a conversation between the local police department and ICE um, to begin the process of removing that person from the uh, from the country. Um, access to safety net is really and um, criminal justice is also very important because oftentimes um, our new American communities are afraid of law enforcement, not only because they're afraid of the fact that um, potentially law, local law enforcement could um, call immigration or call ICE and have these folks removed, but they have internalized fear from their home country. Many folks are leaving um, countries where the government is corrupt, where the police is corrupt. And so when they're victimized, uh, when they're mugged, when they're, um, they experience domestic violence, they won't call the police. They will um, not notify that they have been harmed because of this fear of local law enforcement. We're lucky that in Baltimore County, our um, police department will not ask about immigration status, um, but because of what's happened um, nationally, there is still that fear. And so one of the things that in my role I'm working on doing is um, serving as a bridge to connect local law enforcement with our new American communities. So they're able to feel comfortable um, calling 911 and asking for help when they need it, but also understanding that we have um, local law enforcement that is there to do other things than, um, you know, call ICE. They're there to protect them. So understanding what they can do understanding that, um, you know, if a neighbor is being abusive or if you're um, experiencing abuse, you can call 911 that it's not going to have um, a detrimental effect on you, um, particularly in uh, jurisdictions where there are a lot of restaurants or, um, you know, communities where there's a lot of um, informal employment in the restaurant industry. These folks are often targeted uh, for uh, for crime, right? Um, in Baltimore City, folks that are undocumented and work in the restaurant industry are called walking ATMs because they get paid in cash. So on Friday, they get, you know, a roll of money um, because of barriers to banking. They will walk around with with cash instead of being able to deposit it into a bank account. And so they're targeted for that specific reason. So now thinking about healthcare and how um, this presents a challenge to our immigrant communities, um, these are the different forms of health care that we can access, right? As U.S. citizens, um, we're able to access um, employment-based based health insurance, the different uh, programs offered in the, in the marketplace, Medicare and Medicaid. Um, folks that have had their green card, so folks that have been lawful permanent uh, residents um, for at least five years also have the same access to the different forms of health care. But if you are working with a student or a family that has had their green card for less than five years, they're not going to be eligible for Medicaid, right? So there's, you know, another barrier for them. Um, when we're talking about asylees, so an asylee is a person that has been granted asylum. They've gone through the entire um, legal process and have been granted asylum and refugees. Um, they're able to get health care through their employer, through the marketplace, but they are not able to get it through Medicaid. 
I'm sorry, through Medicare. They're not able to get Medicare. They can only get employment based marketplace or Medicaid. Um, so I mentioned briefly temporary protected status um, earlier in the conversation. Uh, temporary protected status is something that um, certain countries, uh, certain nationals of certain countries are able to get. So it's similar to DACA, temporary protected status gives folks access to a work permit and it also gives them protection from deportation. So currently we are um, <clears throat> given TPS to Afghan nationals and Ukrainian nationals. In order to be eligible for TPS, um, you can't just apply for it, right? Um, your home country has to basically petition the US government to extend TPS to your country. Um, currently, the countries that have been designated for TPS are Afghanistan, uh, Burma, El Salvador, Haiti, Honduras, Nepal, Nicaragua, Somalia, Sudan, South Sudan, Syria, Ukraine, Venezuela, and Yemen. Um, this benefit um, is awarded during a specific time period, right? So um, any of our recent arrival folks from the Central American countries of El Salvador, Nicaragua, and Honduras are not eligible for TPS. Uh, you had to have been physically present in the country 20 years ago when it was first designated. So that's why we see a large number of Central American um, residents that are undocumented and we'll see some families that have TPS. Um, TPS, like DACA, does have a fee. So if you're renewing your TPS, um, you have to pay $410, and that covers your application fee. And then you have to pay um, $85 to get a background check. So in total, applying for TPS and DACA is close to $500. Um, for folks that are applying for TPS for the first time, so um, folks from Ukraine and from Afghanistan, um, that initial DACA application will be free, but when they renew, it will um, be $495. And um, I would like to emphasize that the status is temporary, right? So it's not guaranteed to always be renewed. Um, the previous administration tried ending TPS for um, almost all of the countries that had TPS. I think the exception was Venezuela where they um, issued TPS for Venezuela. But now we're back on track and the countries I uh, mentioned earlier are the countries that currently have TPS. Um, so if you have TPS, you can get um, healthcare through your employer or the marketplace, but Medicare and Medicaid, you cannot. Um, and our DACA holders, so if you have any students that currently have DACA, they can get health insurance through their employer, but they can't buy it through the marketplace, Medicare or Medicaid. Um, folks that are here on student or work visas can get health insurance through their employer or the marketplace. And folks that are undocumented in very specific cases may be eligible for Medicaid. Um, and could get on an employment based health packet. Um, but for the most part, our undocumented students are relying on the federally qualified health clinics to receive medical services. But most of those clinics, to be very honest, are at capacity and have a very long wait list to see patients. Similarly, community health clinics um, like St. Clair. Um, on the east side or um, healthcare for the homeless or the clinic at the Esperanza Center all have um, capacity issues where there are not enough service providers to see the many number of people that need the services. And so healthcare becomes a barrier. We've got folks that have treatable uh, conditions such as you know, diabetes or high, or high blood pressure that can't access that primary and preventive care. Um, we've got 
young people that are in our school systems that have mental health issues um, that they're not able to address because of access to health care. Um, with our Afghan and Ukrainian um, students, we're going to see a lot of trauma, obviously, because of what they've experienced in home country. And some of them may not be able to um, access mental health um, services, so it, it will present um, a challenge. So now we're moving on to the language access uh, portion. The reason I want to bring this up, it's because um, it's important that we all are aware of the laws that mandate federal um, that mandate language access. It's uh, a federal mandate and it's a right of folks with limited English proficiency. As uh, public servants and as educators, it's our job to make sure that um, folks with limited English proficiency are accessing services equitably. And the reality is that our county is no longer um, what it was, you know, 20, 30 years ago. Our um, county is very diverse. There are folks from any number of um, countries that have um, limited English proficiency. And so we want to make sure that um, they are receiving equitable services. So when we say limited English proficiency individuals or LEPs, these are folks that do not speak English as their primary language and who have a limited ability to read, speak, write, or understand English. Um, meaningful access is a very um, interesting term because it's never been defined fully, but generally what it means is that folks are having accurate, timely, and effective communication, um, and that language uh, assistance is provided at no cost to these LEP individuals. And just to make sure, again, that we're all using their correct uh, terminology, when we're talking about translations, we're talking about language assistance related to written documents. So you translate a document. Um, when we talk about interpretation, it's the verbal, um, and it can happen in person or through phone. So if I have um, a parent that speaks Pashto, I may use um, a service, uh, a telephone line to interpret that conversation. And vital documents are those that are critical for obtaining services or benefits required by law. Um, So now that we know um, all of that, um, the legal obligation for language access is based on um, Title VI of the Civil Rights Act of 1964, which prohibits uh, discrimination uh, based on the country of origin, the, nas the national, um, national origin, and it does include uh, language. And it was reinforced uh, by Executive Order 13166, uh, by then President Bill Clinton, which mandates language assistance in any program that receives federal funding. So any federal, uh, federally funded program has to make um, language access available to folks. So again, thinking back about challenges that these communities may face, um, Folks with limited English proficiency are um, often not able to communicate fully um, in their everyday lives, and they may be um, limited in what they can do as they try to navigate um, communication with um, folks that are only speak English. Doctor visits, enrolling kids in school, something as simple as going to the grocery store or finding a job or going to the bank can become challenging. And things that we often take um, take for granted, similar to the social safety nets that we have access to, become very challenging for our limited English um, proficient community members. Um, it can be very frustrating to not be able to express your thoughts fully um, or to be understood. Um, so in the county, um, these are the top five languages that are spoken um, besides English, uh, Spanish, Nepali, 
or other Indic languages, Korean, Russian, and uh, West African languages such as Yoruba. Um, so we see in this chart the number of folks that speak it very well and the folks that speak it less than very well. So our folks that speak it less than very well are the ones that would typically need um, language um, access assistance. And so we see that overwhelming majority of folks are folks that speak Spanish, but then followed by um, Nepali, Korean, Russian, and Yorubu, uh, which are very close, um, closely behind. So using a telephonic interpretation is something that I believe most folks that are in the school system are familiar with, right? So um, Language Line is a service that um, can be accessed over the phone and it can be accessed on a landline or a cell phone and it provides the interpretation service, right? So um, through Language Line, uh, folks can have a conversation with somebody else. They will speak what they need or they will say what they want and the interpreter will then repeat what the um, individual said in English. Um, the language line services that are used by the county are um, available in more than 200 languages. Typically, the more common the language, the quicker you're able to get an interpreter for um, a less common language. It may take, um, you know, half an hour, 45 minutes to get an interpreter on the line. One of the things that we can do to make sure that we are um, creating welcoming spaces is having a language ID card printed and on your desk or in the front office so that folks can point to the language they speak, right? So you will see um, in a different language, it will say, I speak, and it'll have the language there. So the person that is assisting the individual can be able to identify what language that person needs when they use language line. When we're working with interpreters, things that are really important is that um, one, obviously determining what the language uh, the individual speaks by using one of those language, those I speak cards, um, just lowering the pace at which you speak, right? You want to um, be cognizant that the person may be struggling to understand what you're saying using simple uh, language, right? You don't want to use jargon. You don't want to use very technical terms. Um, when you're working with the interpreter, you want to make sure that you're speaking uh, two to three sentences at a time. That way you're giving the interpreter enough time to interpret, but also to just process what you're saying. Um, and most importantly, obviously, we want to make sure that we are treating the interpreter and the limited English proficient individual with respect. Um, when we're communicating uh, with folks with limited English proficiency, we want to speak slower. We don't want to speak louder, right? Just because you're yelling doesn't mean that the words that you are using are different. Um, if you're not being understood, use a different word. Um, draw it. Right, so visuals are really helpful. So if you have a map you can point to or some pictures, um, write down numbers, times, or dates. Um, minimize cultural or historical references. So for instance, I'm 40 years old. I've lived in this in the US since I was six going on seven, but we never watched DT as a family. So when folks talk about ET, I have absolutely no idea because I have yet to watch the movie. And so that kind of cultural or historical reference, you know, minimizing when we use pop culture because our pop culture might not be the pop culture that um, LEPs are used to. Um, we don't want to use slang or professional jargon. It can become confusing and um, obviously not using abbreviations or acronyms because, again, those are things that um, they may not be familiar with. And lastly, I always like to close with um, contributions that uh, our new American neighbors make, right? So they increase uh, labor uh, in key sectors and which brings in tax revenue. Um, no matter what we've heard on the news or on the radio, um, 
immigrants do pay taxes and they do contribute to our economy um, in addition to the intellectual contributions and entrepreneurialism and innovation that they bring. They also um, revitalize our neighborhoods. They bring in new, ba new businesses. It increases safety and diversity. And my personal favorite is food because um, really who doesn't love being able to go to a new restaurant and um, participate in someone else's culture and learn about that culture, right? Um, things that as a board that we can do together is we want to advocate for language access and cultural competence. We want to make sure that all of our schools um, are very aware and very clear of what the law is, that they're also um, using the tools that they have access to. We want to be cognizant that um, new Americans oft often come with trauma um, that they themselves may not be aware of, right? So we want to um, be trauma informed. We want to be present and recognize uh, that there may be barriers, that there may be traumas that there um, these folks are not um, aware of. But we also want to avoid paternalization and infantilization. These are folks that um, are bright. These are folks that have made decisions for themselves. You know, a parent that you're working with may not have a high level of education, but it doesn't mean that we talk down to these families, right? It doesn't mean that we talk down um, to the parent just because their education um, isn't as high as um, perhaps even their child. And we want to make sure that we know what services are available, right? So when you're working with students um, that are new to the country or students that um, may not have access to some of the different service services that we've talked about, that you know where you can refer them to. Um, so that concludes my TED Talk. Um, I will go ahead and try to stop the sharing. Thank you so very that, much for that. Um, are you available to an, ask answer yes. any questions if any yes, of the I was council say, members? So I will try to. Did I stop sharing correctly? I think you did. I don't. You don't right. see your screen anymore. At least All I right. don't. All right. So yes, absolutely. If folks have. Um, questions um, or comments, please. OK, um, she's on the phone, but she sent me a text, Miss Joes, so I put her name in there um, and um, everyone else. If you have any questions and you have access to the chat, just put your name in so that we can make sure that um, we call on everyone um, who would like to add or ask a question. So you can go first, Miss Joes. Thank you, Miss Scott. I want to thank you for this presentation. It was wonderful. I've been to BCPS's ESOL Center, and I also want to state that all of our policies are on our website in, I think, about 12 languages. Um, I don't know if that's something that your office is aware of for uh, some of our students that attend BCPS and their parents. And I want to give a shout out to a former student member of the board who came in as a refugee and today is a sophomore at Yale. So thank you for everything that you do. And as an immigrant, um, you know, I especially, especially want to thank you. Thank you so much. Those are, you know, students like that are the ones that um, are thankful for, right? And we're grateful for the opportunities that they've had. Um, yes, I've been working. Um, very closely with the Welcome Center because of um, just some capacity issues there has uh, in, you know, since I've been in this role we have, I have had constituents reach out because they've had difficulty um, reaching the Welcome Center. Um, you know, one of the things that I don't touch on during this presentation, but it is something um, specifically with the school system that's important, is making sure that folks um, that work in the front offices that assist families with enrollment are aware of the McKenney Vento Act and know that some of these um, refugee and um, unaccompanied minor students are technically considered homeless. And so we can't ask the parent or the family member or person that is taking care of them uh, for um, custody papers. I had a family that is actually working with a Ukrainian student reach out to me. Um, the student is their nephew and they don't have custody of this child, but this child was literally 
shipped over um, fleeing the war, uh, but they don't have custody papers and the school that they uh, were trying to enroll the child in asked them for custody papers. And so we want to make sure that um, as we learn more, we share the knowledge and we're um, creating a space that's welcoming for all of our uh, students. Wow, thank you for that. And um, I echo um, what everyone is saying here. This is very informative, very well done. Um, I have the presentation up and I just wanted to make sure um, I didn't know if it was in board docs as a PDF um, because at the very end you put some suggestions in there and I wanted to make sure I understood it correctly. And this is Miss um, Scott speaking. Uh, it says what we can do together. And are these areas that you're suggesting where the school system and your office ways that we can improve or ways that we can start working together? Right, so it's, it's things that we can improve. It's things that we can do as individuals. It's things that we can do as a board, right? So making sure that we are improving um, our language access, right? Um, there's always room for improvement. Making sure that we're budgeting for um, language access. Some schools struggle with uh, translating documents because um, it can be expensive, right? Uh, just because I'm fully fluent in Spanish, doesn't mean that I have the training or the capacity to translate documents coming out of the county executive's office, right? Um, and quite frankly, that is not my job, right? So if you've got an ESOL teacher or if you've got a guidance counselor and they happen to be fluent in DARI, it doesn't mean that then in addition to being a guidance counselor, their job becomes being the DARI translator. So improving how we offer those services and being equitable in it is really important. Um, you know, the traumas, there's a question from Ms. Norton about, yes. about uh, traumas says, to look for. Yeah, if you could read, uh, it says, are there any trauma look for that we should be aware of? Are there specific trainings that school staff can take? Right, so the School of Social Work, uh, the Maryland School of Social Work offers trainings. Um, I've, in my previous job, participated in, in some of them. Um, things that we have to be aware of is just, you know, recognizing that, uh, particularly with our kids, they're coming in from the Northern Triangle countries, so Honduras, Guatemala, El Salvador. Um, they experienced a lot of violence in home country for the um, overwhelming majority of them are coming because they are fleeing the violence. Uh, a lot of them may have seen and been witness to murders, rapes, um, extreme poverty, uh, abuse at the hands of their caretakers. So, you know, the things that we see with kids that are experiencing depression are the same things that many of these kids will present, right? So when you do trauma-informed care or when you think about kids that may be getting bullied, um, those are the the triggers that we can see, right? Um, you may see that some of the kids that come from Afghanistan will be really sensitive to loud noises. Um, things like that um, are really important. The Migration Policy Institute is one of my go-to websites. It's actually one of uh, the places where I get a lot of the information that I've shared with you all today. Um, and they do a lot of trainings. They offer a lot of um, information about um, not only migration policy, but also um, trainings. And they also have a lot of information about working with um, English language learners that um, if it's something that is interesting to you, you should um, you know, check out the website. Also, uh, read some of the reports. There's always trainings. Uh, there's been a lot of focus on our ELL students and how they've um, come back from the pandemic and pointing to some of the inequities that we we all know that they had, right? So, our, our, you know, the, the access to technology and, um, you know, the, the test scores, how low they've come back. So, I put the um, the link to the migration policy um, website on the chat. Hi. 
All right, thank you for that. And um, yeah, oh yes, that's very helpful. And I do want to be respectful of everyone's time and everything. So it looks like you'd also put your email down there um, and the link um, so that we could follow up if anyone had um, additional questions. But um, I, Ms. Fink, thank you so much. I mean, that this has been a really, really informative um, presentation. So, and thank you so much for your time and, and, and sharing that with us. Thank you so much. And um, please, um, my door is always open. So send as many emails as you want. If you have families that are uh, struggling to connect with services, please um, share my contact information with them. Great, thank you. Are you there, Mr. Handy? <laughs> yes, Ms. Scott, I am here. Wonderful, thank you. So it looks like the next item for the council to hear um, is updates, and this will be facilitated by Mr. Handy. Yes, thank you, Ms. Scott. I um, want to thank Ms. Uh, Valencia Banks as well. Um, so really, before I get into next year, just a few items on that, I want to thank uh, the equity committee members. Thank you all for your time. Thank you for your request in forming this advisory. Uh, this was our first year to have the advisory, so thank you for uh, your patience and engagement as we work through what the advisory would look like. I um, also want to thank our council members. Uh, several have been at every meeting, uh, and I want to thank them for their persistence um, throughout you know, the challenging school year that we've had, so I want to express some gratitude for that as well. And uh, thanks to my fellow staff members who um, have helped to support these efforts as well. Uh, so really want to express gratitude in that regard. So I uh, want to talk about next uh, school year. I'm very uh, happy to report that we've had our first planning meeting already. So there's some council members who've gone, I guess, an extra mile and agreed to be part of the planning team to help us prepare for next school year. Uh, we also have some proposed dates for these meetings between our equity committee and our equity advisory council. So I want to share those dates. Let me just make sure. Hold on just a minute. I want to share the dates and see if we can just reach consensus on having these as our meeting dates. So you rec might recall this year we were uh, really flexible in trying to get our, our meeting scheduled. So we want to get the dates out so folks can prepare for the next school year. These are all Thursdays, by the way. And I want to thank uh, Ms. Sibley, Ms. Donna Sibley, for helping me to uh, just uh, compare calendars for the school system. Of course, we wanted to avoid the uh, weeks that the board of, full Board of Education met. Uh, so I want to thank Ms. Sibley again for helping me uh, to generate these dates. So these are the dates that I would like to suggest. I want to see if anyone uh, had any concerns, but if we can reach consensus, I know these might not work for every participant, but wanted to see if we can go forward with these as our meeting dates. And maybe start with the uh, the board members. Uh, hopefully these will work for a quorum of the board. I know we'll have a new student member coming on board. I don't know if uh, yes. they'll be a part of this committee, but so we have a few variables to understand. So I don't have an issue with these, but I, I just wanted to make sure that it's OK with the council members um, if they had any issues or questions or, or concerns, as well as other board members. And if you're not able to say it, you can always put it in chat. Um, that's actually a good question that was brought up by um, Ms. Ms. Denmeyer. Are calendar invites sent out to the council members? Yes, uh, Ms. Scott and Ms. Denmeyer, if I can comment on that. So uh, we do have uh, Ms. Gover sending the invites. Uh, so these are actually, so Ms. Ms. Uh, Gover actually suggested the month, and then these are the dates. So once we can agree on these dates, I will uh, we'll contact Ms. Gover and she'll have the calendar invites sent out. Um, so that way everyone will have them on their calendar for the entire year. And then Ms. Scott, if um, 
I, I saw Miss Rowe commented, and then I was going to reply to Miss Norton. So, okay, if I do that. Yep. Okay. So, thank you, Miss Rowe. And right now, I said we have some right some variables. Of course, we have new student board member starting that uh, September meeting, and then we'll have um, the new board after December, as Miss Rowe has pointed out. Um, and then uh, Miss Norton's question was the time. Yes, the time will be the same. So, still looking at five thirty to seven. And thank you, Ms. McCall, for responding as well. All right, so just wanted to give enough time. I think we are good at this point. Uh, so Ms. Scott, that's all I had. Again, this is our final meeting of, of the council and the committee. So again, I um, want to just thank everyone for being a part of it. Thank you again. Uh, to Ms. Valencia Banks for joining and presenting this this evening and uh, looking forward to coming together as as this group at our September meeting. So uh, Ms. Scott, I'll turn it back over to you at this point. Sorry, I was on mute. <laughs> Thank you very much for that. Um, so I wanted to say before we conclude, um, is there any further business? OK. Great. Well, since there's no further business and this meeting is adjourned, thank you all so much for joining and I hope everyone has a wonderful evening.